Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, good to be back. We are now at Lecture 5 in our Historical Theology course. Again, we're going through the Doctrine of the Trinity and the Doctrine of God. And so we're looking at the early Church Fathers, uh, beginning with uh, you know the very first century, uh, rolling up to around the 600s, I think, is when I will conclude this course. Uh, my ultimate goal, again, is to actually go to modern times, but we shall see. Um, so, but yeah, let's get started. Um, again, last lecture we had finished looking at the theologian Clement of Alexandria, and so today we are going to be looking at Tertullian. Um, I tried to do them both last time, but Tertullian is such a profound thinker, and I had so much material on him that he would need a lecture all to himself. And then even again, then again, we're not covering everything that he has written or discussed. So, um, so let's get started. So. <clears throat> Tertullian. Oops, slides. Get my slides working. Here we go. There he is. Little quote here God is not if he is not one. Again, we'll see this a little bit later. Um, but Tertullian was from around 160 to 225. When you guys see that little C right there, that means circa, which means around. We don't know the exact year or date, so sometimes you'll see that on these uh, um, biographical. You know notes about about these guys as far as when they lived and when they died. So, uh, but famous famous church historian Alois Grillmeyer says next to Augustine, Tertullian is the most important and original ecclesiastical author in Latin. Um, his writings were penetrating and direct, in that most of them were heretical refutations of Gnostic teachings especially against a guy named Marcion. We talked about Gnosticism um, earlier in Irenaeus, uh, but Marcion, again, was the most formidable heretic of the early church. A lot of writings are about him, but he had kind of his own Bible. He had the Old God, Old Testament God, New Testament God. The Old Testament God was the evil God. The New Testament God was the good God. And so, obviously, that was really uh, counter counterproductive to advancing sound doctrine. Um, so, as we come to Tertullian, we see that in his writings... His language becomes much more precise than those before him, especially in how he defines the essence and being of God uh, because of such, a, you know, such importance that they had. So, and, and this is, this is uh, fundamental uh, in our Christian doctrine of God. It shows that his ideas um, were, were really kind of became the foundation for later thinkers like Athanasius and Augustine and other church fathers. And also in the Councils of Nicaea in 325 and Chalcedon at 451, and their lasting uh, formularies to, to come after it. But um, <clears throat> Tertullian's use of the Latin Trinitas is the first application of the term Trinity to deity. So again, he's that's why one reason why he's a, a Latin thinker, because the Trinity, Trinitas, is a Latin phrase. And again, he was the first to apply it to the deity. And again, obviously, Trinity is not in the Bible. But again, as we start to go through the development of the doctrine of God and the Trinity, such language that's outside the Bible becomes employed to explain what the Bible teaches. But the chief principle of Christ Christian theology for Tertullian is, God is not if he is not one, because we more properly believe that that has not, <laughs> sorry, that's a hard saying, but because we more properly believe that has not existence, which is not as it ought to be. And that's the most clunkiest sentence. I don't know why it's my first time actually trying to read it out loud. It just, it works better on paper. So, but just remember that God is not if he is not one, but to ask God, to ask what God is, will reveal that he is not otherwise than one. Here, Tertullian offers this definition of God. He says, God is the great supreme, existing in eternity, unbegotten, unmade, without beginning, without end. For such a condition as this must needs be ascribed to that eternity which makes God to be the great supreme, because for such a purpose as this is the very attribute in God. Oops, sorry. And so on as to the other qualities, so that God is the great supreme in form and in reason and in might and in power. If you notice, we saw that phrase supreme 
that wasn't in the earliest writers. That became something we, we kind of follow, um, come to find afterwards in more developed theology. But Tertullian understood that God revealed himself first from nature and afterwards authenticated by instruction. He reveals himself by his works in Romans 1, 19 through 20. And God reveals himself through his revealed announcements, Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, where he says, and he spoke in times of Abraham. Now in these last times, he speaks by his son or in son as the actual literal Greek phrases. The bulk of Tertullian's, write, Tertullian's writings were polemical and apologetic. So if you don't know what polemical means, pol, uh, pole, uh, polemical means, in a sense, to, means to fight, or polemicia, I think is what the actual word is, maybe it's just polemic, but it means war, actually. And so when you're engaging in a polemical debate, it's more of a combative war debate. So, so polemical is debative, and whereas apologetic is defense of the faith. So he's debating with heretics, he's debating with others even, you know, of the same same fold, but then he's also engaging in apologetics against uh, with Marcion. But Marcion blamed God for man's fall, and Tertullian responded, starting his defense with the God as creator, whose attributes of goodness, foreknowledge, and power that cannot be called into question. And that's where we want to start, right? We want to start with the foundation of God as creator. That is who he is. Uh, Tertullian starts to then speak about how creation testifies to God's attributes. Again, good, he's, again, he's grounding it in Romans 1, 19-20. It's what we see around us, right? It, it, it reveals to us God's divine nature and invisible power. It shows us goodness because creation springs out of nothing. Tertullian defends God's foreknowledge of the fall, yet showing God is free of sin and that because of God's foreknowledge, he proclaimed a caution against it, the fall, under the penalty of death. Now, a few chapters later, he affirms that nothing can happen against the will of God. Now, I have a little footnote here on my slide. He says, For while holding this earnestness and truth of the good God, which are indeed capable of proof from the rational creation, you will not wonder at the fact that God did not interfere to prevent the occurrence of what he wished not to happen in order that he might keep from harm what he had wished. Now, Augustine says something very similar later on. Uh, this is a, a, a work that John Calvin cited in his work on the, the eternal predestination of God. But Augustine says, again, going back to the fall, going back to Adam and Eve, he says, In sinning, they, Adam and Eve, did what God did not will in order that God, through their evil will, might do what he willed. A little bit more rhetorically balanced than which you'd seen Tertullian, and that was what Augustine's kind of primary trade was, is he had a background in, in rhetoric. Um, but back to tortilla. That's a, I apologize. It's a, it may sound like I say tortilla, <laughs> but I struggle with that word, unfortunately. So Tertullian. Maybe I can come up with a short one. Um, tert. <laughs> I call him Tert. We'll see how that goes. Anyways, so Tert points the blame back to man, stating that God const constituted him free, master of his own will and power. He states that God would not have imposed a law on man had it not been in his power to render that, he, that obedience which is due to law. <clears throat> God sets before man good and evil, which man will either be obedient or resistant to God's calling, threatening and or exhorting from sin. With that said, Tertullian writes, God, however, did foreknow that man would make a bad use of his created constitution. Now, some of you might have caught on this, but we can see that he doesn't have a really developed understanding of divine foreknowledge and man's fall. He kind of resorts back to a free will. And, and there'll be people that will say, you know, the early church fathers didn't teach on predestination or, or man's man not having free will. Um, I'm sorry. That's what they taught on. That's what they emphasized on. But um, so that becomes like an argument saying that this whole thing about not having free will or having this, um, you know, we're in bondage to sin and we can only act according to that sinfulness. Um, that topic wasn't really developed until Augustine came out. So that's one thing about theology is that, especially in the early phases of, of Christian history, is that 
Uh, you know, doctrine came out of controversy. Doctrine came out of heretics coming in and bringing teaching that really countered and contradicted the scriptures. So I have a brief footnote here about Tertullian, but he says that um, he held that man's freedom of will was a gift to be enjoyed, and that was the common view among the early church fathers, like I mentioned. However, the nature of the will was not a pressing topic of debate, so though they assumed a libertarian view of man, and that's what you kind of would see, which that's still even that phrase is, is anachronistic, right? We're, we're importing a term developed now back to a time when that wasn't really a big topic of discussion. Um, again, that came out between Augustine and Pelagius. But Tertullian does not dismiss the foreknowledge of God, keeping the tension between man's liberty and divine sovereignty. And that's an important piece because, again, even though they might have held to a view of libertarian free will, they were very firm defenders of the foreknowledge of God. That God has all knowledge. God has causal knowledge. God ordains the beginning from the end. The scriptures say that. Again, so we are we are bounded by the biblical text, and that's what uh, Tert is doing. But at the same time, again, if, if you he, he's affirming both of those things, but you would kind of look at him and say, well, they they don't they don't um, they're not compatible, and and you don't see him really developing that element of the free will argument. And like I said, that came much later on. So, but threatening, calling, and exhorting aside, Tert affirms that God has unilateral power within the wills of men to fulfill his purposes. However, for heretics like Marcion, to whom Tert is responding, such power implicates God as the author of evil. And that's a problem that my fellow Reformed brothers and sisters that we will engage with and deal with, and everybody, even folks that aren't Reformed, um, you know, that becomes a big argument, saying that if God ordained everything, then God is the author of evil. Now, that term author of evil, um, I, re I reject what the um, critics are trying to assume by that because God cannot commit evil. He can't be the author of evil. However, he's ordained it to be. And in his divine wisdom, evil is better that it's here than it not be here because God has allowed it to be. He's ordained it to be. He uses it for his purposes. And we just have to realize that we can't wrap our minds around that, and um, but ultimately, at the end of the day, I sin, you sin, we all sin, because we desire to do so. And we should think more of that, hey, God should smite us because of our sin, but he doesn't because of his grace and his love. So, anyways, but getting back to Tert, <laughs> in the classic example of the hardening of Pharaoh's heart in Exodus 7 to 14, Tert makes no qualms about it. He says, God hardens the heart of Pharaoh. But God's act of hardening, writes Tertullian, is not a sinful evil, which belongs only to the devil. Rather, it is a penal evil, God's act of divine justice against disobedience. So we can see the distinction. It comes down to the intentions of the heart. Now, I would say evil is anybody wanting to do contrary to the will of God. That's what evil is. Obviously, Pharaoh thought he was his own God, and he thought he was the God. And so God, from a penal standpoint, as the judge of everything, of everyone, he brings divine justice against him for his disobedience, as he should. So in making this distinction, Tert balances the antinomy that is required for consistency and in interpretation. Such careful handling of Scripture does... Did I do my slides? I did. Okay. Sorry, guys. Squirrel. Um, such careful handling of Scripture does justice to texts such as Isaiah 45, 7, where it says, I create evil, whereby a surface reading seems to implicate God as the author of evil in the manner that Marcion and other heretics have assumed. Now, Tertullian affirms that God's... No, sorry. Tur <laughs> I'm going to go back to Tert, okay? Tert affirms... The truth of God's involvement behind evil, but grounds it in God's holy and righteous will, which removes any implication of, of God as the author, in a sense, as, as, as God committing the evil act, right? That puts his holiness and goodness in question. God is simple. He is holy. He is good. He's not evil. He can't be evil. Therefore, 
following Turt's distinction of evils, God's authorship of penal evil in the case of Pharaoh, resulting in God's hardening of his heart, is because he, Pharaoh, deserved to be influenced to his destruction because he had already denied God, having long been guilty before the God before God of Gentile idolatry, worshiping the crocodile in preference of the living God. Like I said, that's what was Pharaoh's desire of his heart, was to worship a God created in the image of a creepy crawling thing, of a crocodile. So Turt's doctrine of God carries the proper distinction between God and man, in that God is alone good by nature, whereas man who exists by creation Quote, is not disposed to good, but by creation, not having it, goodness, as his own attribute to be good. Right? We have goodness that's been given to us. We don't have it in our essence. We don't have it in our nature. Um, God's good goodness is who he is. We are not good. We have been given any kind of goodness. Right? But obviously, we have vices that uh, we give into. Uh, Augustine talks about that in the city of God. I, I may get to that when we get to Augustine, but we shall see. But anyways, um, what did I say here? Yeah, so God bestowed goodness on man. Therefore, because he is not intrinsically good as God is, he has the liberty to do good or evil. And Augustine would say that because we are created from nothing, right, we do then have this liberty to do both. Uh, we are not good in our essence as far as uh, being eternal and because we're, we're, we're made out of nothing um, in a sense there is the opportunity, the ability, the liberty to do good or evil. Um, though Tertullian does not articulate a doctrine of divine simplicity, his argument of God's intrinsic goodness belonging to God's self alone seems to establish this logical understanding intuitive of divinity. <clears throat> now again, um, we are looking at theology being developed. So some of these terms, as we use now, are not always used then. I mean, we do start to see uh, simple essence being used, but uh, Tertullian um, doesn't really have that, um, that vocabulary being developed or being utilized. Um, <clears throat> okay, where was I at? So in his treatise against Hermogenes, God's uniqueness, his qualities of divinity, Tert writes, by his sole possession of them, God is one. End quote. New quote. Whatever belongs to God belongs to him alone. Whatever creatures have from God, we receive it. It doesn't come from ourselves. So even though he's not using the doctrine of divine simplicity or defining it, the way he understands God is that God is simple. Right? God is his essence. He is his attributes. He is everything that's from him. Because if God has, re has received something like we are, then he is made of a parts and there's something before, behind, greater than God that has now given him these parts to make him who he is. And that would violate um, the essence of who God truly is and that what we believe that God, you know, philosophically what this kind of leads us to. Well, and in this view of divinity, as Turt sees expressed in the scripture, leads him to the doctrine of creatio ex nihilo, stating that before all things came to be, when God created, there was present with him no power, no material, no nature which belonged to any other than himself. Using Romans 11.36 to frame his argument, uh, which Tertullian intends to demonstrate, leads to absurdity if one denies God's work of creation from nothing. This is what he writes. He says, this rule is required by the nature of the one only God, who is one only in no other way than as the sole God, and in no other, other way soul than as having nothing else coexistent with him. So also he will be first because all things are after him, and all things are after him because all things are by him, and all things are by him because they are of nothing. So that reason coincides with the scripture, which says, Quote, who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or with whom has he taken counsel, or who has shown him the way of wisdom and knowledge, and who has first given to him, and it shall be recompensed to him again, surely none. So if you know 
Romans 11:36 for 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 by him and through him and to him are all things. So that's an argument of various prepositions to emphasize that God creates from himself, not from anything else. And that's what creatio ex nihilo means. It doesn't mean God, as I mentioned this, I think the last lecture, God doesn't have a a bag of nothing and then he pulls something out of it and, oh, here we go, right? No, he, he doesn't. So basically God has created from himself. All things come from him. All things originate from God, the one only God. <clears throat> So while Tert defended Ex Nihilo, his specific argument was against Hermogenes' opinion that matter is eternal. And that was kind of a, a common view during this time, is that matter's always been. All right, so that's what Hermogenes said. And this was grounds for heresy because it places creation on the same ontological rank as the creator. Because the question is, if you have something that's material and it's, it's eternal, which means it's always been, then you have God who's always been. How can that be without the material itself either being God or God being the material? And so now you have this kind of dualism. We were obviously we're not going to say that matter is God, but they're both eternal in what makes them eternal. Because if they're eternal, that means they cannot be destroyed and that they're self-existent. Only one God, only God is self-existent, Material cannot be. So, again, that was really conflicting against what Scripture says. Um, I covered that. I tend to do this. What will happen is I will break from what I'm reading to everybody into some type of little monologue, and then I come back to my notes and I'm like, oh, I just already said that. <clears throat> so, I'm not going to repeat it. But anyways, so Hermogenes writes Tert, while he doesn't, Quote, acknowledge any other Christ as Lord, he takes from him everything which is God, since he will not have it that he made all things of nothing. Again, so that was the challenge that how could God make something out of nothing? But we were, as the arguments came prior, we we're pressed to say that. We are, we are pressed to what Scripture says, that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And we see Scripture talk about God's uh, distinction from his creation. Right, So... These things force us to come to these conclusions, and a lot of people don't like that, so they challenge it. In one of his arguments, he connects the phrase, in the beginning, from Genesis 1-1 and John 1-1, with Proverbs 8-22. This chapter in Proverbs, specifically verses 22-30, to 30, uh, is about wisdom which the author personifies. The New, the New Testament refers to Christ as the power of God and the wisdom of God. And that's from 1 Corinthians 1.24. And that's a very, very important verse for establishing the doctrine of, of divine simplicity as well. And also on the same point that how Jesus is one with God, because you would say, if Jesus is the wisdom and power of God, when was God ever without his power or his wisdom? So that would be an argument to say that um, God and Christ are one. Uh, and, and, uh, yeah, so uh, John calls the Logos the Word, which is Jesus, right? And it is Christ, the wisdom and power of God, who created all things from nothing. So Proverbs 8.22 states, quote, The Lord required me, sorry, the Lord acquired me at the beginning of his creation, before his works of long ago. Now, heretics, however, will use this passage to advocate the view that Christ, who is wisdom personified, is a created being because it states that he was acquired by the Lord. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses will notoriously use that one all the time. But wait till you see how, how uh, Tert, Tertullian, kind of handles it. Fix my notes here. Sorry about that. So he begins by observing that in the beginning only means the initial one. Okay, It does not refer to substance, but rather inception. Now, while it may sound as if this point conflicts with his argument, the argument is challenging Hermogenes' view that beginning actually means substance. So to say in the beginning is to reference matter from which God created Taking another slide. Okay, so here, here's Tertullian, here's his argument. He says, For since all things were made by the wisdom of God, 
It follows that when God made both the heaven and the earth in principio, that is to say, in the beginning, he made them in his wisdom. If, indeed, beginning had a material signification, the scripture would not have informed us that God God made so-and-so in principio at the beginning, but rather ex principio, of the beginning. Now remember, the, the discussion is that beginning means substance, right? So scripture would not have said in the beginning, it would have said of the beginning, because the beginning would be from which God created, right? For he would have not, sorry, back to the quote, for he would not have created in, but of matter. When wisdom, however, was referred to, it was quite right to say in the beginning. A few chapters later, uh, Tert writes, quote, Indeed, as soon as he perceived it to be necessary for his creation of the world, he immediately creates it and generates it in himself. So, the act of creation is ineffable. We have no way to compare to have an analogous understanding of what it means to create from nothing. So we just use the best terms that we can have to explain what actually bringing being into existence is. And that's where you see this this phrase here, um, generates in himself. Now he doesn't like, you know, that's something he um, has it like a baby, right? Um, And it kind of grows in his belly. Um, so anyways, so the acquiring of wisdom was not that God at some point was without wisdom and then acquired it again, as I said earlier, how could God be without his wisdom and be God rather it was quote, in fact, the beginning of his ways, this is, this is a great phrase. It was the beginning of his ways, this meditation and arrangement being the primal operation of wisdom opening as it does the way to the works by the act of meditation and thought end quote god's creating was done in wisdom so acquiring wisdom is not as much he had to have wisdom is that he's speaking of what is created in what what is needed to create something wisdom right wisdom so the operation of wisdom was utilized in the creation of all things. So next time you have your Jehovah's Witness come by your house and talk about Christ, you tell them that what that passage means is that it was the operation of wisdom in the beginning of God's works. So back to Tertullian, he holds that God is immutable yet mutable. And like I said, theology is being developed. So we we can't always just kind of like hammer these guys for not having things worked out, right? But we are grateful because it's the foundation they help establish. And as theology continues to develop, we get more and more precise in our language. Now, even today, though, I mean, the doctrine of immutability is a hot topic. Um, So, again, it's it's one of those things I think we're always going to be kind of going back and forth with. But anyways, so responding to the heathen philosophers, he writes, quote, Come now, do you allow that the divine being... Being not only has nothing servile in his course, but exists in unimpaired integrity and ought not to be diminished or suspended or destroyed. Well then, all his blessedness would disappear if he were ever subject to change. So he, there's the immutability of God, but yet is immutable. Because immutability is a property of eternity, it is impossible, writes Tertullian, for God either to become less or cease to exist. And that's what those doctrines are about. When we're using these doctrines of, or words to speak of immutability, uh, eternity, impassibility, um, these are all, all phrases or doctrines or concepts, whatever you want to say, to say what God is not. If God is eternal, he cannot cease to exist, right? <clears throat> and we know from Scripture shows us who God is, he doesn't change his mind, he doesn't change who he is, he doesn't go from sad to happy, nothing changes about God. He's the same today, forever, or is it the, the same yesterday, today, and forever, excuse me, sorry, from Hebrews. All right, uh, and God, being eternal, the magnum sumum, means not only can he not become less, he also cannot become more. <clears throat> 
God's eternality means that God is not of antiquity nor in novelty, but rather it in its own true nature. Eternity has not time. It is itself all time. If acts, it acts, it cannot then suffer. End quote. Now this is where Tertullian expressed a mutability in God, in which flows from himself being eternally good and just, as he judges human sinfulness, having the feelings of a judge, such as offense and anger. I think we're safe to assume Tertullian was expressing that what we call relational or communicable attributes to his creation. Again, these terms were not in his theology. We are These are de- later developed terms that we're applying to the situation to try to see to where um, Tertullian lands at. So, in raising up an adversary, mankind, it became necessary for God to express anger and offense displayed in a temporal manner because his goodness demands that he punish injustice. It would be unbecoming or unworthy of the divine being as not to execute retribution on what he has disliked and forbidden. Marcion's God, Tertullian argues, cannot feel and cannot punish. Therefore, he cannot be God. In God's attributes of goodness and justice, his severity is good because it is just. And while Tert intimates that God has emotions, he's careful to claim that we must understand them not in the manner as man has them. Man's emotions, his passions, are due to a corrupt condition. God and man have different natures. With God being divine, he is incorruptible. Thus, he can he does not have <coughs> excuse me, what is proper to creatures. So, in the scriptures, attribution of human features, hands, eyes, and feet, and sensations to God, these must not be compared with human beings univocally, right? In the same manner, right? You can use them analogically, but not univocally. It's not a one-to-one ratio. We use it to say what God is like, but God literally does not have an eyeball. He doesn't have a hand. He doesn't have feet. At the same time, he doesn't have human emotions. So we, we would uh, attribute to them, to God, in a supreme way. In Tertullian writes, there's a long one, These sensations in the human being are rendered just as corrupt by the corruptibility of man's substance, as in God they are rendered incorruptible by the incorruption of the divine essence. Do you really believe the Creator to be God? By all means, is your reply. How then do you suppose that in God there is anything human and not that all is divine? That's a good point, right? Him whom you do not deny to be God, you confess to be not human, because when you confess him to be God, you have in fact already determined that he is undoubtedly diverse from every sort of human conditions. Furthermore, Although you allow with others that man was embreathed by God into a living soul, not God by man, it is yet palpably absurd of you to be placing human characteristics in God rather than divine ones in man, and clothing God in the likeness of man instead of man in the image of God. And this, therefore, is to be deemed the likeness of God in man, that the human soul has the same emotions and sensations as God, although they are not of the same kind, differing as they do both in their conditions and their issues according to their nature. So, we can see what he's trying to say. He's he's trying to be very precise, recognizing that God is distinct from creatures. So, even though we use language towards God that speaks in a relational or a communicable way, and God does that for us, we cannot say that God has emotions as humans have emotions. Now, there's a very big debate, or continual debate, modern debate, if you will. And it, I mean, it happened uh, throughout the years about God having emotions. Now, the word emotion itself and what it actually means is wasn't developed until the 1800s, I believe. So it is strange to see that the translator here used emotion, um, but normally has to refer to an internal... Um, inner organ movement, that kind of thing. And so, obviously, it's to express us, you know, God 
having the sense of of hanger or compassion or sadness but again god in his essence can't be sad god in his essence can't feel pain right again these are these are things that humans feel because god is goodness god is holy god is righteous now he can demonstrate those things through his perfections but he doesn't he doesn't have a sadness in his nature and his essence as we would have and so again that's why the debate's always going to continue we want to uh, cuz here's the thing if we if we allow god if we allow to if we allow god to have the same I don't know, attributes, if you will, of human creatures or same uh, designations, and then there's scriptures that God cannot fulfill, right? God cannot be everywhere present of his entire creation, right, if God has a body. So we can't just do away with and say, well, just the anthropomorphic language we can recognize as being analogous, but when it comes to the anthropopathic language, of the emotional, the the movement, the feeling, the stuff. Like a lot of the open theists will latch onto that and say, "Well, no, that's a one to one." But we can't, we can't do that. We can't do that because then, and, and God in Scripture says that He is not a man that He can't do this, right? He's not a man He shouldn't lie. So, um, or that He should repent, right? Repentance. That's the main passage in in First or First Kings. Well, I'm going to get to that first before I, because once again, I'm going off in rabbit trail and it's here in my notes. So I want to be more precise with it. So let's get back to this. Sorry about that. So therefore, God in his incorruptible nature is truly happy. And though he gets angered, he does not get irritated, nor can he be tempted. Uh, James 1.13. He will be moved, but not subverted. So while Tertullian does not define a theory of analogy, nevertheless, he understands that God's feelings are analogous to our own. God's feelings move him in a manner fit to his own, and man's feelings affect him in a way equally his own. Now again, me reading this doesn't mean I fully agree with it. We're just trying to understand Tertullian's thoughts here. So in the manner of texts that speak of God repenting or relenting, as in Jonah, Marcion uses this to discredit Tertullian's God as a good judge, for a good judge doesn't go back on his decrees. Now again, Tert, referencing such texts as 1 Samuel 15, 29, shows the lack of consistency in Marcion's understanding of the creator, the creator-creature distinction, though these terms are not used in his writings. Uh, Tert makes Marcion through a basic theology proper lesson, I'm sorry, takes Marcion through a basic theology proper lesson, whereby he says that no one would bear Marcion's views of God if he denied his foreknowledge, which is, a de which is a denial of his divinity. It is a proper attribute of it. So then, what kind of nonsense is Marcion implying here? Now, using the clearer passages of like 1 Samuel 15, 29 to interpret the more obscure in Jonah 3, 10, Tert hinges his argument on the essence and nature of God, where we should always start. He says, God will never repent of an act of justice. And it now remains that we should understand what God's repentance means. For although man repents most frequently on the recollection of a sin, and occasionally even from the unpleasantness of some good action, this is never the case with God. For inasmuch as God neither commits sin nor condemns a good action, insofar as there no room in him for repentance of either a good or an evil deed. Divine repentance cannot be seen in human categories because repentance is proper only to the creature, not God. Who does God... Who does God repent of and to? And Tertullian uses the words of Scripture to state his case. He is not a man that he should repent. What is the meaning, then, of God repenting? He writes, For it will have no other meaning than in a simple change of a prior purpose, and this is admissible without any blame, even in a man, much more in God, whose very purpose is is faultless. Now, he concludes, in the Greek, 
Now in the Greek, the word for repentance, metanoia, is formed not from the confession of a sin, but from a change of mind, which in God we have shown to be regulated by the occurrence of varying circumstances. Um, so, what he's doing here is he's focusing on divine action. So, when we go back to the passage in 1 Samuel 15, and where it says that God um, was upset or repented, oh yeah, repented of making Saul king. So we say, oh wow, he was, he was sorrowful. He's repentant of that. So, but the thing is, did God's plan change? Was was Saul to be the one that was going to be the leader of Israel? No, it was always to be David. Right? It was always going to be David. That was God's decree. But through redemptive, redemptive history, through through time and space, you know, God is then. You know, he, he put Saul in place for his people, which they asked for a king like everybody else. So they were sinful for even doing that, and he gave them a king who they wanted. And obviously God put him in place there, but um, what did this king do? He decided to do things by his own will. He didn't follow God's law. He wasn't obedient, and therefore the kingdom was taken from him. And so God, by saying he, you know, regretted making Saul king, it's to show to his people that God does not favor god does not approve of his actions how, how else would god do it? he's trying to show to us who really understand that saul's what saul did was not good for his people showing his people that he doesn't hold god's um law as 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 supreme as 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 holy like he should have so um i got a note here from an article by a gentleman last name is hallman i forget his first name but um, he, he points out there's kind of these various types of mutability in, in Tertullian. Um, God fills the various emotions appropriate to judging. He becomes the judge of sinful, human sinfulness. Now, I say that what we see in Tertullian is an inconsistency in his theology. So either he did not understand or fully realize the implications of the Platonic philosophical presuppositions in his doctrine of God. Now, we haven't mentioned anything about Platonism, but again, these guys, their philosophy was grounded in Platonism. I mean, so there's some baggage there that they're kind of bringing into their theology, um, which, you know, that has to be kind of rooted out, worked out. Um, obviously, there's truth in there, and, you know, Augustine was a Platonist. Uh, uh, Thomas Aquinas was primarily an Aristotelian. Um, so there's all this truth in this philosophical thinking. We just have to you know, hold it subservient to scripture, and, um, yeah, so, all right, we are now going to be looking at the divine economy, the evolution of the doctrine of the Trinity, so, a key teaching or rule that functions as an interpretive framework developed by early church fathers is economy, or okonomia in the Greek, which refers to the arrangement of order of the works of God. So that's a, a rule that kind of lays out um, kind of the, disp the dispensations of, of God's economy, of how he orders history and how he brings to it, brings to his conclusion, his works, right? But we'll see later, there's another interpretive framework bifurcated as economia and theologia. So... In this mode of thinking, the economia is theological discourse that pertains to God's divine acts in time following the redemptive biblical narrative. And then theologia is theological discourse about the essence of God, which is a little bit more speculative. Now, interpreters of scripture can derail Christian teaching by confusing the two when doing theology. So the error one generally will make is using economia to develop or articulate a theologia. So that would be looking at the person of Christ, how he acts in time and space in the flesh, and then that becomes the lens or the light or the view cast on to God. And for those of you that are quick thinkers out there, you can see the problem with that. Because now we're looking at God through a human lens. Instead of looking at God through revelation... And what is revealed to us in Scripture, and what we know of God as He we see about Him in, cre in creation. So that was a, a big problem in kind of modern theology and Trinitarian Trinitarian theology. This resurgence of of looking at the divine nature, the divine essence, the persons of God 
through the lens of Christ. And so that becomes the way we actually then, we place it and project it upon God's essence. And we can't do this. That's where the whole idea about God having to suffer, a suffering God. How can God really suffer if he is not in the flesh? And so somehow Christ taking on flesh, God then suffers. And so the thing is, God doesn't need to suffer. He, by an act of grace, took on flesh and felt, he felt human suffering in the person of Jesus. So, anyways, um, so the, I already read that. Okay. So if, if one's approach isn't ordered rightly, for example, then one will struggle to manage the tension between the divine and the human aspects of Christ, resulting in an inconsistent theology. Thus you land in heresy land again. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought my recording stopped for a second. Okay. So Tert speaks of divine economy in reference to the Godhead, whereby this one only God has also a son, his word, who proceeded from himself. And the spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son. Now we're talking about theologia. We're not going to talking about economia. We're talking about the divine persons. So this is going back to God in his essence. And then the economy would be how God reveals himself in time and space in his Son and in the Spirit. Now, the economy is the articulation by way of revelation of the unity of God distributed into a trinity. Or, ordering, ordering, we can use the term taxonomy, but ordering the three persons, yet one substance of number without division. So God is one, and the economy of the one God is Father, Son, and the Spirit, of which all that has appeared in the Father reappears unchanged alike in worth, substance, and power in the other persons of the Trinity. Now, one thing we have to also remember is that we don't think of persons of the Trinity as human persons, as self-contained, distinct beings or centers of consciousness. And that's one of the errors we see today. The persons refer to the relationships, the relations within the divine Godhead of Father, Son, and Spirit, but they're not separate or distinct partited beings. So here, Tertullian, he introduces the persona, referring to each the Father, Son, and Spirit. And this becomes enshrined in the Western tradition. Um, we'll note here, furthermore, the use of persona or the Greek prosopon functions as an interpretive tool in the early church that articulates the doctrine of the Trinity apart from the need for speculative metaphysics. And we will touch on that here shortly. So, Tert writes, But almost all the Psalms which prophesy of the person of Christ represent the Son as conversing with the Father. That is, represent Christ as speaking to God. Observe also the Spirit speaking of the Father and the Son in the character, or the Greek word prosopon, or he would say persona in the Greek, of a third person. Quote, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit upon my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Water, hold on. So, using what is referred to now, what we call now, as a prosopological reading, whereby the historical figures in the text, so David <coughs> in Psalm 110.1, we just read, and then we see it also in Acts 4.25, where Luke writes, you said through the Holy Spirit by the mouth of our father David. Okay, So again, whereby the historical figures in the text are actually God, the Spirit, and or Christ speaking to God in the prosopon or character of David, for example. So the messianic and prophetic passages such as Psalm 2, 7, 22, and Psalm 110, where David writes, and my Lord says to my Lord, is actually Christ speaking, the second person of the Trinity, the Logos, Christ speaking through David to the Father, which is then fulfilled in the created world when Christ arrives. David is the character through whom the Spirit spoke. So, the Psalms do not merely speak of Christ, rather in the Psalms, Christ actually speaks. <clears throat> 
So when looking back to the Old Testament utterances of the triune God, the prophets took on the prosopa, the Greek for persons, characters, or masks, in the grand theodrama, making a person-centered exegesis which contributed greatly to the development of the Trinity in the emphasis of person language and one God substance language to express the three in one mystery. And this is Nicene Orthodoxy. So the key point is that a, a prosopological reading of the text reveals to us a divine dialogue, a Trinitarian discourse taking place through the prophets by the divine spirit who is not chronologically constrained, which is then literally fulfilled in Christ. The Logos was inspiring David so that the Psalms become Christ's own speech. Excuse me. Um, I didn't include all this. Um, hold on a second. Yeah, so um, I got a quote here from Craig Carter in his book. Um, <laughs> I just forgot what it was. I'll cite his quote. Sorry. So Craig Carter writes, The difference between prosopological exegesis in typological exegesis is that in typological exegesis, we may see Christ opaquely in the Old Testament text, but in prosopological exegesis, we actually hear Christ speak clearly in the text. So Holy Scripture manifests the living presence of God as the author and the main character. All Scripture points to Christ. So Christ was speaking to us in Revelation in the Old Testament. God was speaking to God through various human characters, and then he manifests in the actual person, fulfilling those roles, fulfilling what he said to himself, right? So that's the difference, you know, typological is saying that David was a type of Christ, Adam's a type of Christ, Moses, right? So this is saying this is actually God in the person or in the mask, in the character of somebody in the Old Testament, speaking by the Spirit. Remember, Father, Son, Spirit, there's nowhere in the Bible that the triune God does not exist, but in this case, it's, it's God speaking to God's self in the person of David. So Tertullian's development of the doctrine of the Trinity provides clarity regarding Jesus, particularly since the church confesses Christ as God of God. He shows the distinction of persons, personas, in the Godhead, which you'd say una substantia, which we see throughout Scripture, where we have ascriptions to each of the persons. So, for example, John 1, 1 through 18, John 16, Matthew 3, 16, uh, and so, forth, so on and so forth. But uh, we have ascriptions to each of the persons and also the fulfillment of key texts in the Old Covenant, whereby God is going to restore Israel and put a son of David on the throne forever, which ultimately, who is put on the throne? Christ, he is put on the throne in heaven at the right hand of God. That's ultimately the, the greater fulfillment of that. The true fulfillment, excuse me. However, Tert, at times, does use persons and beings interchangeably, which will become a problem later with the sophisticated development of the doctrine of divine simplicity, which is like the backbone to our Trinitarian theology. Now, those critical of the Trinity being taught in Scripture challenge Tert's views by referring to passages such as Isaiah 44, 24, which speaks of God stretching out the heavens by myself, who alone spread out the earth. In response, Tert argues the point, as already noted, that Christ is the wisdom and power of God. So also referring to Psalm 33, 6, which says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. So again, when was God, without his wisdom and power, how did God create? Now, in looking at the debate, however, it seems that we have two equally valid views pitted against each other. But Tertullian can reconcile the alleged contradiction, writing that the point of alone is to distinguish monotheism from idols. So God is making the point, I alone, only me, created everything. Nobody else did. No other gods or deities did. So he's making a distinction, not speaking of himself and his essence or about the triunity of God, but saying that God alone, Father, Son, and Spirit, not anything else, not other idol, is who created heaven and earth. So God alone 
and not other gods, they do not exist, created the universe. So God as creator is the chief identifying mark of the only true God. And God, having created alone, stretched out the heavens alone with his Son, who is God. The Son also has the distinct designation of creator. And we know that in the New Testament. Again, another way to, to defend and argue and have apologetics for the deity of Christ. If, if God alone is the creator and Christ is designated as the creator as well, what does that make Christ? And you can actually go back to those passages and say the point that God was saying that he alone created is to distinguish from idols, would distinguish from false pagan beliefs. So now in the New Testament, if Christ is creator and attributed the same thing, what does that say about Christ? Obviously, he is God in the flesh. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, however, Scripture states that there is only one true God, Deuteronomy 6.4. Tert, retaining both equally true claims in Scripture, expresses that the Father and the Son are two, not by severance of their substance, rather from the dispensation or economy wherein we declare the Son to be undivided and inseparable from the Father, distinct in degree, not in state. Okay, not in his essence, not as a separate being, right? So the identity of Christ as God is manifested in the works he does, which only God can do. Uh, exegeting John 10, 30, 32, 34 through 8, showing the inseparability of the divine works, Tertullian writes, Oh, I didn't... I gypped you guys on a slide. Um... Oh, I did. I just went to it too soon. Okay. He says, It must therefore be by the works that the Father is in the Son, and the Son in the Father. And so it is by the works that we understand that the Father is one with the Son. All along did he therefore strenuously aim at this conclusion, that while they were of one power and essence, they should still be believed to be two. For otherwise, unless they were believed to be two, the Son could not possibly be believed to have any existence at all. Remember going back to the argument with Hermogenes about uh, matter being eternal. Well, there can only be one necessary being. And if there's two distinct beings, then there's two, and they're both equally valid as being God, then they should be one. They shouldn't be. There can't be two necessary beings because then they ultimately, either there are one together or one's the necessary being and the other one is not. And then we have an idol, and then we have the one true God. <coughs> Excuse me. So, the Son who was indivisible from the Father, being everywhere with him, was revealed according to the divine economy, whereby at the right time, the Son would be regarded on earth as he is in heaven. Tertullian delves into a fascinating discussion of the evolution of the Son proceeding from the Father, the outworking of the economy, as illustrated by the operation of human thought and consciousness. So he refers to the word as reason, and God having reason in himself before the beginning of all things had not yet spoke out. God, silently by reason, planned in himself what he was going to utter through his word. And likewise, this voice of reason we have in our heads, silently within us, meeting us with a word at every moment of our thoughts. So he says, whatever we think, there is a word. Whatever we conceive, there is reason. And this word, Tertullian writes, in a certain sense is a second person within you. Isn't this, isn't this genius? Is a second person within you through which in thinking you utter speech and through which also by reciprocity of process in uttering speech you generate thought. So he's getting very, very technical about how our reason, our thoughts, our wisdom, our language, our words all comes out. And so we can use this analogy to look at the Father and the Son. The Word. God speaks His Word. The Word becomes flesh, right? I spoke things into existence. Who's He speaking? He's speaking, He's, he's using His wisdom to speak creation into existence. So at the beginning of His works, he has this wisdom inside of him, right? And then through reason, 
He exhibits it. He shows it in creation through his word. It's a great, great uh, rhetorical device and a, and a device of analogy to really try to understand in the way that we can as humans um, how God can be one and how Christ is one with him. So, so this second person that we all have as well, right? Go back to God. This second person utters speech in our mind and externally when we decide to speak out. So then how much more supreme in this in, is in God since we are made in his likeness and his image? And by this, uh, Tert establishes a, a fixed principle, quote, that even before the creation of the universe, God was not alone since he had within himself both reason and inherent in him reason, his word, which he made second to himself by agitating it within himself. So, end quote. So, not again, he didn't make it in him, right? But made second to himself by agitating it within himself. So, I don't know, agitating, I'm not sure what actually the way that's used that way, but, but, um, so what we can say is that when God decided to create, he spoke his mind, right? There's that phrase, he spoke his mind. So, through reason and wisdom, God creates what he has what's already been made in his mind, in his intelligence, in his reason, right? What he thinks, he brings it to be. So when God wanted to create, he spoke it. He spoke his mind. So the revelation of, Christ, of God in Christ, the image of God, Tertullian argues that the Father is always invisible and the Son visible. Now following the pattern of thought we observed in the previous paragraph, Tert writes, quote, The Father acts by mind and thought, while the Son, who's in the Father's mind and thought, Give effect and form to what he sees. Now, that might sound familiar to you. John 5, 19 says, Jesus only does what he sees the Father doing. Thus, all things were made by the Son, and without him was not anything made. John 1, 3. So, in order to dispel the heretical view that the Son and Spirit are emanations from the Father, as taught by Gnostics, uh, Tert uses an illustration from nature to demonstrate the unity and sameness that each person of the Godhead share, the divine economy. So his intention is key, key to understanding Trinitarian monotheism. Quote, everything which proceeds from something else must needs be second to that which it proceeds without being on that account separated. And so, end quote. And so to illustrate this important point, Turt alludes to a tree and its roots, a fountain and a river, the sun and its rays. And these are classic expressions from nature that the early church fathers used all the time when trying to speak in an analogous way of the Trinity. So he says, Following therefore the form of these analogies, I confess that what that I call God and his word, the Father and his Son too. For the root and the tree are distinctly two things, but correlatively joined. The fountain and the river are also two things, but indivisible. So likewise, the sun and the ray are two forms, but coherent ones. So now while these illustrations are instructive for the Father and the Son, what about the spirit? The spirit? In response, Tertullian speaks of a tree, its root, and its fruit. How perfectly fitting is this illustration? The fruit of the spirit, right? So we can speak of a tree, a root, and its fruit. All one tree, but correlatively re related, connected to each other as one. Now, again, um, oh, oh yeah, and each one is distinct, yet nothing is alien from that original source whence it derives its own properties. The, the fruit derives everything from the tree. The essence of the tree, this is where the fruit comes from. Now, while all illustrations kind of break down, um, <clears throat> because they don't act in a personal way, right? Again, we're talking about the divine trinity. Um, scripture teaches us that creation reveals a creator. So we should see the stamp of God on all things around us. That's what, the tr that's what they're doing. Utilizing the examples in creation to point us back to the Creator. And that's the whole what Revelation, or, uh, Romans 1, 19 through 20 is about, right? It's that, that creation reveals God to us, reveals his divine nature, his eternal power, and that kind of thing. 
So, while God is spirit, thus invisible, he has given us things in his creation that provide a glimpse of his glory. Again, that's me again, breaking away from my text, and then going back and repeating myself. So, from Tertullian, we get a rule of faith understanding of the divine economy, and that there is distinction, but not diversity, or we'd say, or separation. The order of the triune God, Father of the Son, and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, Tertullian writes, produces three coherent persons who are yet distinct from one another. These three are one essence, not one person, as it is said, I and the Father are one, in respect of unity of substance, not singularity of number, end quote. But again, we see a lack of precision in Tert's expression of the economy, writing that, quote, the Father is the entire substance, de substantia patris, but the Son, a derivation and portion of the whole, which Tertullian argues from the Son's own words, my Father is greater than I. Now, Trinitarian orthodoxy does not hold to the Son as a portion of the whole. Rather, quote, there are three divine hypostases, or personas, that are instantiations of the divine nature, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. However, Tertullian's contributions add greater substance to the Church's confession that Christ is Lord, the Logos who is God. So we recognize what he has brought to the table, we can see where he's kind of inconsistent, a little bit squirrely, right? I mean, even that language that we say he's a portion, now we're making God parts. And we already said there wasn't a developed doctrine of divine simplicity in Tertullian's theology. Um, <clears throat> but what he did is he gave us language to speak about the three without fragmenting Christian monotheism. Now, again, he still mentioned the whole portion thing, but overall, um, he provided the grammar that we needed to be very precise. But the divine life still needs to be explored so that we have a grammar to communicate that which is ineffable. I said that in the very first lecture, right? We're trying to have a grammar to communicate about God. It's not about being, it's not about logic. It's about language. It's about being able to, to discuss things about God in, in a way that doesn't take away from his ineffable essence of who he is. <clears throat> All right. Um, we're going to get now to the hypostatic union. Um, yeah, I'll leave that there for now. So, so when God takes on flesh, we are faced with the mystery of how this could be. Does the son change into a human? Does he transform into a human? If God became man by way of change, then he would no longer be God. How do the two natures unite in one without losing one or the other? God cannot go from uncreated to created status, right? He can't do that. So Tertullian works through this dilemma of how the word became flesh, first dispelling the idea of transfiguration. Uh, then he said God could not have become man through transfiguration because it is the destruction of that which previously existed. He would have to destroy himself as the eternal divine essence and then somehow make himself into a creature, and it doesn't work that way. That which is transformed ceases to be what it once was and begins to be what it is not. So, we hold that God is unchangeable and incapable of form as being eternal. End quote. So, if Jesus is a compounded substance, flesh and spirit, we lose the, dis the two distinct natures having neither but a kind of mixture a third substance, or the famous Latin, is the tertium quid, right? We have a third substance. We have a, we have like what's called like a mutant. If you watch Avengers, those are mutants. That's a kind of a, a third substance. We see this humanist to him. Then they have these kind of deity-type qualities, but they're all kind of wrapped in one, so we have a mutant. Christ obviously is not a mutant. We would denigrate him to think of him such way, right? So how do we work through this? Because the scripture speaks of the Son of God as Son by the Spirit of Holiness and the Son of David according to the flesh, Tertullian writes, quote, We see plainly the twofold state, which is not confounded but conjoined in one person, Jesus, God, and man. End quote. Let me see. Okay. Um, yeah. 
So, so then what does that mean in regards to how we are to speak of the natures? Now, this is theologically called the communication of properties or communicato idiomata uh, in the Latin of each together in the one person, yet they're distinct and preserved, right? How we do that. So what we have in Christ, and this is what we conclude as far as our, our, our uh, uh, Nicene theology would be, Nicene orthodoxy. So what we have in Christ is a union of the two whereby the divinity does all things suitable to itself. So what the divine essence does, wonders, mighty deeds, miracles, right? That's the divine essence that does those things. And then the flesh exhibited the affections which belong to it, hunger, thirst, temptation, and death. So therefore, quote, and this is what he says, in one person, they no doubt are well, are well able to be coexistence, in that the apostle calls him the mediator between God and men, end quote. Thus affirming the son's, quote, participation of both substances. So by, by speaking of the person of Jesus, right, we speak of that the person has the nature of the, the divine side and the human side, we can say and be theologically accurate that God died on the cross, or we can say Jesus created the world. Now with that said, Tertullian expresses the importance of avoiding blasphemy against God, being careful to denote that when we speak of God dying, we affirm that God did not die after the divine nature, rather he died after the human nature. So heretics always crop up to challenge orthodox teaching, and in this discussion they assert that in the son's suffering, the father is a fellow sufferer. Now, the invisible father, who is eternal spirit, cannot suffer. The charge, however, is that the father should suffer with his son because they are united as one. Now, Tertullian responds, referring to the distinctions of the persons in the divine Godhead, that the father is separate from the son, though not from him as God. And to illustrate this point on how the son and father can be one, yet the son suffer, but the father does not, he, Tertullian, once again, use a reference to nature. And he writes, For even if a river be soiled with mire and mud, although it flows from the fountain identical in nature with it, it is not separated from the fountain, yet the injury which affects the stream reaches not to the fountain. And although it is the water of the fountain which suffers down the stream still, since it is not affected as the fountain, but only in the river, the fountain suffers nothing but only the river which issues from the fountain, end quote. So just think of a fountain pouring out a river, and if all the mud and murkiness on this end of the, of the river gets stirred up, does it get back to the fountain from the, with the river flowing from it? It doesn't. But again, the source, right, it's still connected to the source, but the murky mud does not get back and pollute the fountain. So again, they're helpful. Um, but it's not very precise, and so we have uh, actually a great book I'll show right here. This one, it is called The Same God Who Works All Things, Inseparable Operations in Trinitarian Theology by Adonis Vidu. Uh, the first work, the first monograph actually on inseparable operations to talk through some of these kind of thorny issues. It does a great job. I'm, I'm, I started it, I don't know, about four months ago. I'll put it down, uh, but really excellent work. Uh, I will be finishing it here at some point, but really good work to kind of to kind of really be precise in understanding how this language works and how we can try to talk about it. So, what Adonis does in his book, he, he starts to use what's called modal language, not mo modalism as what unfortunately a lot of current critics are trying to hit him with, but kind of speaking the modality of the of the person of the Son, how he acts though being connected to the Father and the Spirit, and so the modal language helps us kind of give us another category to say how the Son acts in his humanity while being energized by the divinity of the Father and the Son. But those actions he does are specific to that mode of the person. So you don't have the separation. You still have the same operation, the same full act of Father, Son, Spirit, but it manifests in a sense in the mode of the person. 
um, and the mode retains retains the divine essence but what happens in the person we can say then is only um, uh, is only specific to that person doing the action so um, I know it's been a little while hopefully I was kind of clear on that but anyways <clears throat> so so in the son's suffering his cry to the father has a quote voice of flesh and soul from the humanity of Jesus Tertullian says, quote, It was uttered so as to prove the impassibility of God, who forsook his son so far as he handed him over, his human substance to the suffering of death, end quote. And while he forsook him, not sparing him, but in delivering him up, in the end he received him back as we read Jesus' cry again, not of dereliction, but this time of reception. He says, quote, Father, into your hands I entrust my spirit, and he breathed his last breath. Luke twenty three forty six. So, in conclusion, in Tertullian, we can see a greater theological rigor in his Trinitarian and Christological theology. So the language to speak of the Trinity becomes more precise still. Obviously, there's still more precision needed, but remember, it's developing. Utilizing terms that allow him to speak of the Trinitas, yet retain God's oneness. I mentioned in the opening of the lecture that Tertullian's mantra, God is not if he is not one. So that's always going to be retained in, Christ, in Christian theology, but we're always going to express it in a Trinitarian way. But yet the more oneness we see, the more threeness, and the more threeness we see, the more oneness, and that's how our doctrine should be. Because Tertullian is pressed by the boundaries of Scripture that Yahweh is one and the only true God. However, he is also pressed by scriptural revelation to affirm that God is three. So, Tertullian's developed doctrine of God has a foundational role in establishing the early Christian doctrine of God, as affirmed in the later councils to come, and for later theologians as they look back and they work through um, making tighter formulations with greater clarity and consistency with the biblical text, right? So, the biblical text is the foundation. Now, we don't want a theology that fits into it. We want a theology that's derived from it. But again, we're going to use language outside the Bible to help, in a sense, hang our theology on in a very uh, consistent manager. So, not nah, manner, not manager. So, anyways, that wraps up our fifth lecture. I hope it was very helpful, and I will see you next time.